Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome back to this session. This uh, second uh, s session today, which is about regional dynamics and inter GCC relations uh, as part of the international third international conference uh, of uh, the. Uh, of this conference uh, held by Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Many people ask, what are our options? What are our position? What are we uh, in this uh, region of Arab uh, that is full of problems and uh, uh, trouble? What will the world lose if all the Arab and Islamic countries uh, would disappear suddenly? Is it uh, really difficult to say nothing? Uh, or just to say this is part of uh, the norms of life in a world that can no longer answer the urgent questions at the time that there are uh, religious uh, extremism, uh, the economic uh, collapse uh, that is leading some people to schizophrenia and some of them to despair and others to extremism and terrorism. Is there any rational explanation of what's happening up in the Arab world? Uh, democracy and uh, freedom is ch are changing into uh, tyranny and uh, uh, people are either between two uh, uh, difficulties in life uh, and the deviation of the revolution, the return of tyranny, the emergence of Daesh, uh, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, and uh, the longest uh, list is longer. The main question is, are we still to see worse than this, and will the future bring more surprises uh, to the Arab world? I am not optimistic by nature, but I am also not, uh, I'm not pessimistic by nature, but I'm also not optimistic about the future of the Arab region. I, this session uh, cannot claim that it will answer all questions, but it will discuss the challenges met by the GCC countries in the regional context, uh, and we'll sp speak about uh, the following topics, the uh, forgotten Arabs in the Gulf, the Turkish uh, Arab relations, the Qatar case, and the Twitter's impact on political dialogue. We'll begin with the first paper, which will be presented by Dr. Maryam Rashid al Khatar which will be about the Twitter's impact on political dialogue in the Arab Gulf states. Dr. Maryam is Deputy Director General of the Doha Center for Freedom of Media. She is a well-known writer in the media and member of the Committee of Alliances of Civilizations and is member of the Board of Directors of Al Jazeera Channel and Al Jazeera Children. She is also specialized in media international relations and has an editorial article in the, in, and has obtained her PhD, her master's degree from Washington, D.C., and is now preparing her doctorate uh, in Britain. I give her the floor. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like to extend my thanks to the Arab Center for giving us this opportunity, and I'd like to ask to thank the chairperson, Mr. Tal Khalid. The title of this conference is about GCC countries, uh, politics and economics in the light of regional international shifts and changes, and uh, within the political and economic con uh, context. So we are going to speak about the Twitter inf impact on political dialogue in the Arab uh, Gulf states, uh, because Twitter and its uh, uh, other uh, similar channels represent the, the, the big changes in democratization of the nations and in finding free tribunes for free, uh, 
and speech and uh, free of expression. Twitter, if you want to, if you want to, uh, the, uh, if you want to define it, you can say it's a bird, or we can say it's 140 characters or figures. Uh, it is a challenge that has imposed itself on conventional media and on the, the culture of politics in the society. If the conventional media is the son of governments, uh, the, the social media, including Twitter, is the, uh, the troublemaking son of uh, the media. We all know that Twitter is a result of technological uh, leap that has led to a lot of improvements in the use and the spread of the use of the usage of social media in the Arab world. This uh, changes in technology were also accompanied by political changes that affected the usage of Twitter. The Arab uh, uh, Gulf and uh, peoples uh, have uh, been affected by Twitter and, uh, and in such a way that there is a big expansion in using Twitter in the GCC countries because uh, Twitter has uh, changed the media uh, landscape from the conventional one, uh, from polarization to uh, multipolarism, and, uh, and uh, making media a tool in the hands of the peoples, not uh, the, uh, the hands of the government. So, so that's why we see that has led to unprecedented revolution, popular revolution, called the uh, virtual streets revolution, which has affected the politics of the countries. My research will uh, speak about the uh, usage of uh, the Twitter and its effects on the political changes and the, uh, and the effects of Twitter on the Arab in practicing and uh, freedoms and the effect of that on the media and then how uh, we focus on the Arab GCC countries and the phenomena that have encouraged the appearance of uh, these uh, characteristics of Twitter, and you also speak of the, 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 the perspectives, whether positive or the negative uh, uh, results or achievements made by uh, Twitter. We will be speaking about uh, the effects of Twitter on the inter-GCC relations and the reactions of the governments on this. Uh, the research was based on a hypothesis that uh, uh, social communication uh, media uh, channels have affected a lot the political uh, uh, landscape in the, especially in the GCC countries because this uh, kind of media, the new media, has challenged the conventional uh, media, especially with the youth people who represent 70% of the population of the Arab world, and they are the dynamics of the social media and leading it. So the media challenge also was represented by the social media and led to some uh, mobilization campaigns and has represented a sort of coup in, uh, from uh, pluralism to uh, uh, multi pluralism. And this represents a, a political uh, transformation because politics and and uh, media are one and the same, and they are intermingled, and Twitter has led to changes in the society on political level and social level, uh, and, and uh, this was uh, all as a, as a result of the uh, Arab Spring in 2011, and has also had its effect on the governments uh, on the of official levels and the diplomatic relations between the GCC countries. To well understand the effects of Twitter, we see this uh, statistics on the on the screen, which shows you the usage of Twitter and of internet in the Arab world and the GCC countries. But here we are only focused on Twitter. The Twitter has been used in Arab by six million persons, and this is by the latest uh, uh, statistics. Uh, 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 by, made by the Dubai College for Government Administration and says that uh, 
uh, Twitter is one of the uh, most largely used uh, blogging uh, tribune. As uh, using of uh, the Twitter in the Arab uh, Gulf, we find that the Gulf countries are on the, on the head of the use uh, the, of those the activists. The Saudi Arabia uh, is the largest one, 2.5 uh, million people are using it then, and the, act, uh, and the activists are even more than Then Kuwait and then Egypt. Uh, while uh, keep in mind that uh, the population of uh, Egypt is, uh, is, uh, is very much larger than the other countries. And, uh, Saudi Arabia is also in the top, uh, is uh, even more, uh, has more usage than uh, even countries like uh, Indonesia. And this, uh, and so we can see that uh, Saudi Arabia is, is, is the usage of Twitter is more than any country in the world. In the, and in fact, uh, the usage of uh, Twitter in all the Arab countries compared to the GCC countries, we find that GCC countries exceed them all. And even the broadband has encouraged that, uh, uh, and uh, uh, cell phones, of course, of course, everybody in uh, the Gulf area has uh, one handset or at least two uh, handsets. Uh, did Twitter affect uh, or has effects on the social movement in the GCC countries, uh, the political movement also? Uh, this is based on the hypothesis of our research because I studied the previous uh, historical events and can I say that yes, uh, the, the activists of uh, the Gulf have used Twitter as a means and a tool for social and political changes and as a means of uh, popular mobilization to call people for protests in the streets, not only in Bahrain, in which uh, the hashtag, uh, uh, the hashtag uh, with Bahrain uh, uh, in 2011 was the, the highest and biggest, but also in the other, other Gulf states, the calls for Twitter in specific ways to go to the streets, but that did not, was not achieved. There is also the Twitter, for every action there is a reaction. So if you want to know what is the effect of the Twitter on the governments, we see that the governments dealt with Twitter in a way to trying to, to uh, control Twitter and affect the, its users uh, because of the political uh, turbulence they, they led to because uh, the, uh, the governments of the, the GC countries were afraid uh, that this might lead to instability. And then there was arrest of some of the bloggers and activists, and they are the first people to be arrested. According to the Arab uh, Monitor for Research and Research, 30 to 40 percent of the prisoners in the Gulf prisons are, are because they criticize the ruling the regime. In Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, there were some demands and movements, uh, political movements calling for uh, the rights of the minorities or specific groups in society. Also in Qatar, there were some demands calling for reforms or against corruption on Twitter. And in Oman, there were also some calls in Twitter uh, for the, some, uh, there was some criticism of some social uh, phenomena and also uh, criticism to the uh, monarch, uh, but then they were released. Uh, in Kuwait, a number of activists were also arrested for the same reason, because they attacked the ruler. As in the, the, uh, the Emirates, uh, the, uh, there is a complaint that there is a low percentage of usage of Twitter by the people, because the people are afraid to, to be accused of being member of Islamic movements. Human Rights Watch has condemned Bahrain, Kuwait, and the Emirates, uh, and Saudi Arabia, because the arrests they made. The conclusion is that these arrests have led to the migration of the people to Twitter using uh, uh, false names uh, or symbolic names or even uh, images and names of foreigners to cover up for their identity 
and that of course uh, makes people stronger. And there were many accounts uh, with the unknown names uh, that were uh, linked to some people who are part of the ruling family and they wanted uh, to uh, criticize their family such as Mushtahid Saudi and Mushtahid Emirat, Mushtahid Kuwait, Mushtahid Qatar as names. Uh, on the other direction, the social media uh, channels have become the virtual arenas for revolutions. But if we go to the applications of uh, uh, the practical aspects of this uh, research, uh, how does that affect the Gulf movement? Uh, to answer this, I call you to analyze this graphic, uh, which uh, includes the names uh, of the countries that are uh, in the on the top of the list of the hashtags used in the Arab world. Uh, what do you notice in this? The Saudi Arabia is the highest uh, on the right. Uh, uh, with, with two names in Arabic and English, uh, and then Bahrain, Qatar, Emirates, and Kuwait, and uh, Egypt, which has the highest number of hashtags uh, in this analysis. Syria will had a setback despite its uh, bloody events. Uh, the question is why? The uh, crisis of withdrawal of uh, ambassadors, uh, Saudis and Emirates and Bahrain's ambassadors were drawn, uh, withdrawn from Qatar in March 2014, and this uh, is better, the best uh, indicator of the usage of uh, Twitter. And and also, uh, this, uh, the mention of this also was, uh, this, uh, Egypt was also mentioned uh, in this analysis that, uh, and this means that this issue is the most important and the biggest in the, uh, on the, in the GCC countries and that almost uh, undermined the, uh, the idea of unity of these countries. And this uh, implies something that uh, the, the Politics has gone into the social and uh, popular movements and affecting the relations between the, the countries. And Twitter has changed from a, a, a communication tool into a hot uh, battle or conflict arenas. And here we go back to the uh, theories of the media that uh, uh, Twitter has changed from being a, a tool to become a system or uh, Harold Laswell, who, who was known for the theory uh, of who, what, to, to whom, when, when, to what effect, uh, until we get the feedback. Marshall McLuhan spoke of the means, uh, which is the message. This uh, theory has been uh, too old now. Uh, we will not wait for the effects. Marshall McLuhan is a specialized in uh, English literature, but he was interested in media and felt that TV was controlling the mentality and lives of people and in five minutes. And I'm sure that he had lived today, he would have said that Twitter and his sisters the, the separate man, man from his wife. And then there is the theory of network theory of power and the strength of weak, weak ties. Uh, these are one of the theories that explain the social changes that because it deals with changes as a block and not as individuals. Uh, the, uh, the, there was a lot of activities in Twitter uh, and uh, about uh, the uh, crisis of withdrawal of the ambassador. And this, uh, uh, even Egypt was mentioned because the, all the uh, Egypt was used to be uh, referred to during these discussions and Iran also because it had occupied the three isles in uh, the Emirates. Uh, and uh, the, the ideas uh, presented in Twitter were very audacious and used a sarcastic language that even made fun of the president uh, uh, and it's not accepted in media because it will push uh, the media from the freedom of uh, expression to uh, attacking people and using foul language which is against human rights declaration and uh, the uh, women I, the article 19 about uh, freedom of expression. Twitter also 
uh, had uh, people who are pro and who are against, uh, and you think that uh, the, uh, there was a dialogue between the, those who are pro and those who are against. Uh, uh, also, the idea, the objective, uh, critical ideas were also reinforced in a good way, and that was also through Twitter, because it's become the source of uh, uh, news and the source of the guests. The pyramid is that the first issue was something between the GC countries. Twitter responded to that. But so then now we have something that happened in the Twitter, and the government, the, the authorities in the British countries uh, responded to them. Now we have a statement by the uh, member of parliament in Kuwait who said, spoke about the Houthis in Yemen and uh, wrote a Twitter that led to uh, anger and rage in the, within the uh, Kuwaiti people and the uh, Bahraini people. And this tweet says that we congratulate the Bahraini people for their victories and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and tomorrow is not like yesterday. The Bahrain issue is in the oven now and will come out well uh, cooked just like a good uh, piece of bread. This, this uh, uh, Twitter that was analyzed in the media that it is incitation to violence, incitation. And this is a reaction from the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Bahrain and said this is bullshit, in fact. And, and uh, so there were demands from the people, for, of the Kuwaiti people, calling for uh, uh, holding this person accountable. So the conclusion, the, to, to Twitter opens the doors for political dialogue and also become a tool to send political messages and to uh, uh, comment on uh, local issues. I finally, I would like to confirm that uh, Twitter enforces the political dialogue and the uh, popular di dialogue within uh, one country between the GC countries, and Twitter uh, has enforced the uh, intellectual discussions and also has encouraged uh, uh, having different uh, false or major accounts for the, for the same person and to us and tutors also uh, might encourage uh, uh, f false news and lies and also has also encouraged the intelligence attacks uh, one uh, from one country as, uh, to another country uh, in conclusion, the recommendation says that Twitter represents in the GC countries a very important means to, for measuring the public opinion and that we should not uh, neglect because even uh, troublemaking children should be taken into consideration and should well live. And Twitter is also a future uh, tool for to know what will be uh, the future trends in the future on the, on the social and political levels of the GC countries. The, the, Social media is a means and a goal that might be a double-edged arm and that might bring points together or might incite to violence or differences between the people of one country or even one uh, tribe. Thank you very much. So as not to be accused of uh, being dictators, as men, we granted you more time. The issue of Arabistan, as called the, the province of Ahwaz, has been pending for more than 90 years, and it's not being spoken about or embraced by any of the media. The following paper will address the issue of Ahwaz, or Arabistan, by Dr. Muhammad al Misfer, who is professor of uh, uh, polit politics uh, political studies in the University of, of Qatar. He had a number of research and studies in the Arab uh, domain. He is also contributing to the Arab and Qatari <coughs> newspaper. And from New York, where he got his degree to Arabistan, he will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What I will narrate now, I will give an uh, account of historical facts as a reminder, and at the end of the paper, it will be my own view on how to address this issue. Within this context, the Arab world 
is being dismembered and divided from Arabistan to the east, Alexandrona to the north, Septa or Malila to the west, Somalia to the west. This is how the Arab world is being dismembered, divided from the heart, Iraq, Syria, into the Arabian Peninsula, as historians say, the forgotten Arabs. The date of this province, and I will read to spare time, the history of this province dates back to uh, ancient times where many Arab tribes resided, Al-Am tribe, Kaab tribe, Bani Namr, at the dawn of uh, Islam, as historians confirm. They were the Arab tri tribes that have been residing in Ahwaz province or Arabistan till day. Taraf tribe, Salah, Lam, Malik, Khalid, Jamiz, Zubayd, Rabia, to the north, to the south, Kaab tribes and Tamim tribes. The name Ahwaz or Arabistan is attributed to the place where the Arab resided. It was divided into sections or sectors or provinces, F agricultural one where each tribe had its own share or position in Arabic Hausa and in plural Ahwaz means sections or provinces. The Arabs make up the majority till date despite the forcible displacement into Iran. None of the Arab nomads have mentioned that this is affiliated to Persia, including Petro Tasker and the German Christine Nebor. All these navigators say that the coast that stretches from Hormuz to Elam is Arabistan or Al Ahwaz, the true Arabistan area. The province occupies a significant, geographically significant location to the east of the Arabian Gulf. It extends north to the Rosnan Mountains, to the east, uh, Kurdistan uh, mountain, mountainous chain, separating the Iranian ridge and extending to the west to the east of Iraq. Uh, I hope that the map could be presented on the screen. The area the area of the province is about 39,000 square miles. The makeup of the population about 4.5 million people. The most important cities are Badan, Khafaja, Dizful, Sulaiman Mosque, Bahbahan, Huwaiza, Muhammara, and Bushahar. Abadan is named after Abad ibn Hassan who lived in the Umayyad uh, Caliphate era. It is also uh, described as being one of the most religious. That's why it's called Abadan out of worship. In the 14th uh, century, the first political agenda was crystallized where an, a united, united, unified Arab country was triggered under the leadership of al mushashai between 1401 to 1469. He's an Arab from Iraq, from Wasit, and he enjoyed the support of the Arab tribes, including al maadi Arznan, Sudan, and Thai. The Ahwaz, a uniformed, uh, or united, or unified country, has suffered great challenges. However, the spirit of resistance and uh, fortitude between Abada, Laith, Asad, Hutayt, and Banu Sa'ad tribe has managed them to stand up to all the attempts to undermine the Ahwaz or Arabistan. In the 15th century, Shiraz, Abadan, Dawraq, and the eastern coast of the Arab coast until Bandar Abbas joined the province, extending to the north to include Chuster, Bakhtaria, Luristan, Yibat, Karmanshah, Saira, Bahbahan, and other areas. The second phase of a uniform Ahwazi Arabistan entity, the Kabi tribe, which or the Kabi Emirate, was the most uh, robust superpower at that time due to its political and military roles. 
in the 18th century that stood up to the Nader Shah attempts to occupy the area and under many under Bani Kaab under the rulership uh, of uh, Salman bin Sultan managed to extend the borders of the Emirate of Bani Kaab, the Ottomans and the Persians. The emergence of an Arab state, a strong one among in this area has given reservation among the Ottoman and Persian states. That's why they exercise political pressures, including to demand uh, ruler Salman to pay a ransom in order to succumb the province to their political pressures. Salman refused and resisted. The Persian was not pleased to see an Arab state, strong one, arising. And that's why Kaab tribe were subjected to a Persian invasion under Karim Khan rule. However, the Kaabi tribes stood up and defeated the Persians. That's why Karim Khan was pulled back to from the Hawaz. The Safavite state at the beginning of the 16th century, 1501, Radical changes, including the Safavite state that uh, dominated all the Iranian populace, Arab, Azariyun, Kurd, Iranians, Balochistan, Persians, uh, and continued till 1736. 36. The Ottomans defeated the Mamluki uh, Caliphate and uh, dominated most of the Arab world, usurping Baghdad from the shackles of the Persian. This uh, had implications on the Arabistan political status. That's why the Safavite worked towards undermining the state and exterminate it completely. The year 1508 is the beginning of the Safavite era, and the first step by Shah Abbas is to occupy the Arabistan. He was met by fierce and robust resistance, whereby he backed down on his military plan and pretended to be friendly. Then he betrayed them, and Arabistan was occupied. The British role, Khazal, Sheikh Khazal feared Ottomans, and he promised the English to harness all his potentials against a reciprocal promise to provide protection and where if the Persian assault the competences of the, the ruler of Ahwaz, Britain should intervene to provide protection and maintain sovereignty. People rose against <coughs> Mubarak bin Sabah also feared Kuwait at that time and recruited certain Kuwaitis to support his friend Sheikh Hazal in Arabistan on the other bank of the Gulf. However, at that point, the Kuwaitis, that they cannot fight by the side of their fellow brothers in Arabistan, and that's why the Kuwaitis backed down. Britain called for what's called today the GCC. In January 1915, Lord Hartkin called the Arab rulers in the Gulf in a conference to be held in Kuwait. Abaziz bin Saud, uh, the pro Prince of Ahsa, Sheikh, Sheikh Khazal, the Prince of Arabistan, Sheikh Aisha bin Khalifa, of, uh, ruler of Bahrain, Taimur bin Fasil, uh, Prince of Muscat, and also Prince of Kuwait, Mubarak bin Sabah, then. He demanded that those rulers should convene to support uh, uh, al-Ashraf uh, in their struggle against the Ottomans and also to provide protection. And history is repeated. Gulf rulers are convened at the behest of foreign powers to resist other sides. The meeting was not held. King Abdul Aziz was busy uh, unifying his kingdom in the face of bin Rashid, the ruler of Muscat, Sheikh Tamim. He was not able to leave the country. Arabistan also at that time 
and only Sheikh, the ruler of Bahrain, was present. The British conspiracy. In 1914, Britain recognized, officially recognized the independence of Arabistan or Al Ahwaza. Mr. Cox provided the uh, document of recognition to Sheikh Hazal, reiterating that Britain will provide protection to the Arabistan and provide military support following first wa uh, the World War I. Britain backed down on Sheikh Hazal and broke all the promises of protection and dependence and sided with Rida Khan, the then defense, Iranian defense minister who later be became the crown Shah. Britain also feared that's why they backed down on their promise and agreement with Sheikh Hazal, disconnecting all the communications with the Arab tribes to the south of Iraq and also within the Arabistan. And the political attache handed down a decision withdrawing all the promises given to Khazal if he wishes to struggle the Iranian. And at that time, Banikab or Arabistan was occupied in 1925. The Iranian policy is to prevent the use of Arab names, limit uh, the uh, learning or teaching the uh, Arab language, Arabic language, difficulty of joining the universities, but difficulty of wearing the Arab u uniform or traditions, forcible displaced, the Arab door, a role. The Arabs were not able to communicate without the Supreme Commission. Syria was busy in their national Revolution Iraq was uh, under occupation. Ben Saud was busy with his domestic affair. Egypt also was under the British mandate. There were, there was no Arab role. The role of the Arabistan was effective in 1928 uprising in 40, 41, 43, 44, 45, and 1956. The liberation front was formed. I request the chairman to give me only two minutes. In 1964, the issue of Arabistan was listed on the Arab League agenda. However, this item was including that it will be included in the curriculum and textbook of all the member states. However, this action was not put into existence. Iraq, Iran, and the United States we are aware that they are not able or willing to see a strong, robust country in the Arabistan province. That's why Britain brom broke its promises and sided with Ridakh, Shah Rida Khan. Ar uh, Arab, uh, Arabistan was occupied. The same applied to Iraq. They uh, backed Iraq and uh, even backed Iran against Iraq. Even Israel did. They also later sided with the United States and uh, Britain, and now Iraq is occupied by the British-American occupation. That's why the Arab cooperated to drop Iraq and overthrow Iraq, that, like what happened in Arabistan. The conclusion, How? what is the exit? All the Arab media and Gulf media officials and politicians complain of the Iranian intervention and despite the fact that they can undermine and the Iranian national security like th what they are doing in other Arab countries, I suggest we bring together the uh, liberation fronts of the Arab stand, uh, p p province, support the Arab media, opening the universities and educational institution to the uh, Arab stand uh, residents, bringing back the cause of the uh, Arabistan into all the textbook and curriculum of the uh, uh, Arab school, and also to, with respect to the Emirati disputed islands, it should be uh, resurfaced on the international arenas, and also urge the UN and the United States and even Security Council reaching up to the criminal international uh, court of justice to exercise pressure and exercise Brit uh, economic pressures on Iran. A decisive action should be taken against the Al Dawa party in Iraq. The Gulf Cooperation Council should reinvigorate its role 
by supporting the persecuted tribes of Sunni and Shia tribes who are persecuted by sectarian militias and people's protection units that's run and financed by Republican guards of Iran under Suleiman. The Gulf countries also support the non-normalization of relations with al-Dawa parties unless all the political of conscience are released, constitution set up, democratic order set up in pluralism that is not subjected to the Iranian influence. Thank you very much. And No, thank you very much, Mark, to respect it, uh, the time limit. Uh, from Arabistan, we must also speak about Iran, which is the well-skilled uh, chess player that has long Helen uh, and don't know how to play on time. And this is what we see when we follow up the, 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 the Iranian program, uh, uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear program. And, uh, when he was asked uh, what will you do in 30 years he said the 30 times either the king will die or I will die or the donkey will die so now uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the symbol of donkey is now of the democracy of the USA and they are ruling really it anyhow the third paper is about uh, the effect of Oman Iran relations on GCC interaction, presented by Dr. Ahmed Al Masabi, who is the advisor of the Minister of uh, Religious Affairs. He's a researcher of religious affairs and social business. He has uh, studied uh, uh, constitutional uh, law from the Ministry of uh, Cairo and obtained his uh, uh, master's degree from Tunisia and then his PhD from the Sorbonne in France. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Uh, in the beginning, I uh, would like to extend my thanks to the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies for the big effort they are, it is making for the success of this work, of this conference. Uh, I would also like to extend my thanks to the state of Qatar, this uh, state that has always and for more than 10 years uh, been calling and helping and supporting research centers, and so it deserves all our thanks and appreciation. The uh, ir uh, Iranian Omani uh, relations and their effects on the GCC integration is what I will speak about in the coming few minutes. Uh, and uh, as it is clear from the title, it has two main uh, uh, axes uh, or uh, aspects. The first, the, Iraq, uh, the Iranian Omani relations. And the most important problem posed here in this few minutes and in this paper is to ask why has uh, Oman come closer to Iran? Why this rapprochement between Oman and Iran, especially in the past five years, beginning from the visit of Sultan Qaboos to Iran in 2009 and up to the negotiations of the Iranian program uh, uh, with the team uh, plus one uh, group. Uh, what uh, the other aspect that I was speaking about is the effects of this uh, rapprochement between Oman and Iran on the GCC countries' integration. How, how does the GCC uh, uh, Council look upon this rapprochement between Oman and Iran? And what are the negative uh, effects of such a rapprochement on the relations between the GCC countries themselves? The Omani-Iranian relations go back to before the Islam era because we are geographically close to each other and because we have common and joint history. And the relationship between the Persians and the Omanis uh, sometimes were quiet and sometimes uh, were conflictual. That's to say it was uh, a tense uh, relationship in general until the beginning of the 18th century. 
The conflict uh, between uh, Oman and the Persians was mostly a political conflict uh, on uh, strategic uh, influence areas inside the Arab Gulf. In the 18th century, especially after the emergence of the Saudi state, the second one, as a political and constitutional entity in the a strong one in the Gulf. This uh, conflict changed uh, and, uh, in the region, and religion became an important factor, or the main factor in the political conflict. Hence, uh, the political uh, conflict has become uh, has changed from uh, uh, by its players and by the nature of the conflict itself. Uh, in 1970. And after the arrival of Sultan Qaboos and the new uh, political regime in Oman, this regime uh, has, uh, has made a lot of changes to in Oman on their internal and external levels. First of all, uh, the influence of Oman was uh, very much uh, set back uh, in uh, East Africa, an influence that it has for five uh, centuries. And also, the, the uh, uh, since we were in Bridgestan, uh, tracted and to arrive on the Pakistan. Then, the emergence of the Arab Emirates state as a new political uh, constitutional uh, state uh, or uh, entity. Uh, it has always been there, of course, but this I'm speaking on as a constitutional uh, entity. And there were some internal conflicts in Oman at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, and the appearance of the leftist uh, uh, movement in the south of Oman, and also the appearance of the Imama uh, religious movements, uh, which had always uh, appeared uh, during the history of Islamic history in Oman. All these factors have pushed the new political regime in Oman uh, to adopt the most important, uh, uh, two the most important diplomatic principles, uh, uh, that is the principle of uh, uh, militarism and non-intervention in the affairs of other people, uh, countries. Uh, Oman has respected these two principles, uh, even in the very critical times that the Arab world uh, went through during the boycott of uh, Arab boycott of Egypt, during the Iraqi Iran war, the, the first uh, and second uh, Gulf Wars. But uh, the principle of uh, neutrality and non intervention was not, in essence, a diplomatic uh, principle uh, as such only. No. In my opinion, I think they were a strategic, uh, important, uh, self-imposed uh, choice for Oman. Because at that time, Oman didn't have any other strategic choice or option but that one. Why did Oman adopt uh, this strategic option, which is not intervention the affairs of others and the principle of neutrality? First of all, Oman is a country where there are ethnic uh, diversity and religious and, uh, and social diversity for more than six uh, or seven centuries. And, uh, and the political regime is very much aware that getting into any regional conflict in which uh, religion is an important factor, well, this will be directly affected on the political components uh, and the social and religious uh, components of society and would lead to sectarianism in the state of uh, Oman and something that we do not want. Oman was also aware that uh, it is no longer that strong state as it was in the past. Uh, 
in the 17th century or and before that 16th century when it kicked out the port to the Portuguese from East Africa. It has become very much weaker politically, economically, militarily, so it did not want to go into any uh, struggles or regional conflicts that are stronger than it uh, and has re drawn the political identity to focus only on internal affairs. There is also another factor or reason, which is what I always call the, the dropping, the projecting the historical uh, Omani uh, character on the conjecture, on the political situation at the moment. Uh, Oman, by its uh, uh, structure, historical structure, has not taken part in issues that are deep importance for the Arabs. It was part, uh, it is a, a state that, uh, 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 that uh, got away from the Umayyad and the Abbasid states and uh, uh, focused on East Africa and the uh, Indian Ocean. This historical background uh, was the main reason in Oman's adopting this principle of neutrality and non-intervention and in a way that Oman can always move this card in his hand and make use of it whenever it wishes to do so. I will pass over this historical aspect. The visit made by Sultan Qaboos in 2009 was the second visit of the Sultan, or the first as the, the, the era of the Republic of Iran, the first visit for that was at the time of the Shah, it was, it was an empire. And then he also visited Iran in 2013. Between these two visits, uh, or these five past years, uh, there has been an Iranian Omani rapprochement that is uh, significant, but only on two issues, which are the issue of the hostages, and that of the nuclear uh, negotiations between Iran and 5 plus 1, uh, Oman played as a role of mediator in these two issues. In the first issue, Oman succeeded in a, a large extent in the issue of hostages. That's between 2009-2013. And the second issue is still about to succeed, about to be finished. Why has Iran, why has uh, Oman gone closer to uh, Iran in the past five years? And why has it been an important role in the about these issues that are related to the relations between Iran and the West? Uh, Oman, of course, uh, uh, Oman has uh, uh, focused its diplomacy uh, basing uh, its uh, movements on some constants. Uh, uh, of historical constraints and co-resistance that must uh, prevail in the GC countries, not only to the, the Gulf countries only, but all the countries in that region. This uh, moral uh, thesis or basis are correct, and uh, the political thinking in Oman uh, speaks about this uh, since 1973. It's not something new. We believe that these reasons are not substantial in the rapprochement, rapprochement between uh, Oman and Iran. There are more substantial factors compared to this. First, we all agree with Dr. Khalid that the balance of power between the GCC and Iran had a big role in the rapprochement uh, between Oman and uh, Iran. There is a shift in balance, military, economical, and financial, even political. There is another factor, which is the imbalance of power within the GCC members. There is a dominion between that varies and the harmony is absent, is absent among the GCC members. Another or a third factor is 
uh, self-protection. Oman wished to maintain its own economic protection from any provocations or incitement that might take place in future, especially that everyone is aware that the GCC member countries over the past few years have been through many media provocative campaigns. It wished to open an economic chapter on uh, Al Arab Sea through the negotiations with Iran. It also wished to prevent itself from the repercussions of collapse of the domestic fabric. Oman is the only country in the Arab world that is embracing three major sects, Shia, Sunni, and any conflict where religion is a key factor will tear apart the fabric of the society, especially that the Sunni or Shia sects will respond and interact to these conflicts. The, as we are running out of time, is about what is the impact of the Iranian Omani rapprochement on the GCC integration. <laughs> Due to differences of the political mindset of the member states of the GCC in the first place, Saudi Arabia for being the largest, and especially that it is not acting out of its own, yet due to its historical background and heavy weight. They are thinking differently, largely from Oman, who are mainly concerned with the domestic fabric. Three factors. Sultana, Sultanate of Oman, I personally believe, over the past five years, Oman cannot accept to engage any confederal union. It wishes to see the GCC in place to develop the council uh, institutionally and economically, yet it cannot accept that this would lead or result in the formation of a union for three key reasons. First. The political mindset on Oman still respects the historical character of Oman, being not totally melting with the Arab order, even in the League of Arab States as an entity. Second is the GCC, or the Gulf Cooperation Council, is usually built, built on trust and confidence. And this cannot be in harmony with the political reality. Third, and to me, this is the key difference between Oman and Saudi Arabia, is the formation of a confederal union among the council members will cause Oman or uh, Oman to abandon neutrality or cause Saudi Arabia to abandon the Arab world. And this is really very difficult. To respect my timing, thank you very much. It is really an exciting paper, outstanding one. We wish to hear you more when we open the floor for questions, and I believe you will raise controversy. From Iran to Turkey. Spill exporting crisis to conflicts, Kurds, Greece, Bulgaria, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Israel, Europe, Russia, United States, and key GCC key players. What is the nature of relations with Turkey? And a paper will be addressed by Dr. Paulette Aris, who is a global fellow of the International Institute, also senior researcher and coordinator of Conflict Resolution Council in Istanbul is also professor of 
literature and social arts in Tur University of Turkey, served as head of research, obtained PhD from university in Turkey. We give him the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to start uh, thanking to Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies to inviting me. Uh, I would like to apologize. I'll talk in English, and I, I hope uh, uh, English to Arabic translation is better. Uh, since I had very much difficulty to understand the translation otherwise. Uh, okay, my speech will center around uh, Turkey and Qatar, and I will place it to a geopolitical framework. Uh, so people like to uh, tell what they know, of and I'll uh, provide the framework of my uh, academic background. Uh, so the Turkey and uh, Qatar, uh, two important actors. So as the Mr. Chairman introduced, uh, Turkey is uh, towards the little bit uh, European side of West Asia. Qatar is at the heart of Gulf. So how come these two countries emerged as the allies and even we can talk about, you know, uh, long-term partnerships, strategic alliances. If you look at the definitions of the relation between these two countries, uh, we have discussed too much on the basic, what is going on, how the relations occur, which leader is visiting, which country, the general attitudes. So I thought my contribution would be rather to help to conceptualize the relations and provide a geopolitical framework which can also be used to understand the other cases, the relation between other actors in the geography. Uh, I borrow the terminology of critical geopolitics. And critical geopolitics presents three different types of geopolitics. Uh, one is the formal geopolitics. This is the, you know, uh, more or less uh, traditional geopolitical understanding of the states. Uh, one of the speakers in earlier panels were talking about, you know, American realist style of geopolitics. This is, this is an example. Uh, it relies on historical experiences of uh, the states that uh, they appropriate, you know, a mode of uh, approach, geopolitical approach to the uh, neighboring and even faraway territories. The other uh, approach is called the practical geopolitics. So states have these, you know, uh, traditions of geopolitics, but uh, what's going to happen if an immediate situation uh, emerges? And then they have to take practical action to deal with the situation. This is how uh, uh, policymakers connect their geopolitical understanding to the emerging situation uh, on the ground. So the third is the popular geopolitics. That is the reflection of this geopolitical understanding at the grassroots level. At the end of the day, all politics is local. You have to persuade your uh, grassroots, your constituency, if you pay attention to legitimacy at that level. So here in, you know, the, the catchword here in this conference is Arab Spring, and Arab Spring changed the regional geopolitics. I will not go into details, but uh, the whole regional co system has collapsed. And here we are talking about, you know, uh, to reference to some understanding, 30 years war or uh, the struggle for a new Middle East concert. So this is, that means there is no regional organization, operational regional organization. The nation state system is in Geopardy, you know, there is erosion of their legitimacy, and even uh, borders are gaining, borders are losing its meaning. In addition, there are, you know, new non-state actors challenging the regional system and the nation states as well. Uh, well, uh, p uh, Professor Mahmoud, I believe, next to me, he mentioned about, you know, this uh, 
emergence developments and the consolidation of the notion of Arabia. But we are here at a point that uh, there is an exclusive Arabness in this political geography. So there are references that Turkey, Iran, Israel are, you know, gaining prominent role, but I will argue the reverse. Here, uh, Iran, Turkey, Israel, they are losing ground. So if you look at the, the new trends, the changing borders, emerging of non-state actors here, Turkey, Iran, Israel, they have nothing to do with them. So their role is limited. Uh, there is this Arab exclusivity. exclusivity. Uh, in geopolitics, we call this you know, inter interdependent regional contagion. So here, there is an emergent Arabness which poses challenge to re regional actors like Turkey. Here they, you know, uh, they are under influence of what is going on in this Arab interdependent contagion, but they lost their room to maneuver within this Arab interdependent contagion. So here, uh, Turkey and Qatar vis-a-vis uh, -vis Arab Spring developed uh, their own geopolitical reasoning, this is the, what I call the practical geopolitics, uh, to deal with the, the situation. Before Arab Spring, Turkey's relations with Qatar, it was emerging within the Arab re regional system since there were, you know, more or less a functional Arab League and the GCC over there. GCC is regaining its role, uh, I, I believe, having this uh, submit uh, in these days. But still, you know, at that time, Turkey was, you know, an observer to Arab League. The, it was developing, you know, a kind of strategic alliance with the GCC. And then Qatar was a prominent actor within this framework that Turkey was approaching and the, the relations were occurring. But after the Arab Spring, there is no more uh, a possibility for uh, such a framework. So here, uh, Turkey developed, you know, a geopolitical reasoning towards the Arab Spring, which was very much, you know, welcoming the developments uh, occurring on the side of popular masses. So it has been defined in Turkey that there is this emergence of a new collective consciousness in a number of Arab states, which is going to, you know, end up in the whole Arab geography. At the end, it's going to transform the region in a way that, you know, there will occur uh, new governments, new administrations, which will be more friendly to Turkey, since the new rulers will be, you know, backed by the popular masses. So if you look at the, you know, the uh, societal demands, that very much, you know, converts with what Turkey is trying to do at home and in the neighborhood and outside the geography. So uh, Turkey, uh, Arab Spring, the uprisings has been a welcome development in Turkey. So the Turkish policymakers developed a geopolitical reason in that uh, they should side with the opposition, the, and they should ally with the newly emerging uh, governments in this uh, geography. So here, the Turkey is a you know medium-sized re regional power with global or international aspirations. So on the other hand, Qatar is a part of this newly emerging uh, regional interdependent contagion. Uh, but the Qatar's position differed from some other actors even you know, in the GCC. So Qatar was like Turkey. Qatar did not see an immediate threat to its domestic political landscape. So Qatar has seen no possibility of Arab Spring within Qatar. So here, uh, there is this uh, Qatari, I define Qatar as small state uh, with regional aspirations. So here, uh, it was, you know, very much beneficial Qatar to put the instruments, policy instruments, uh, into action that will elevate Qatar from that small state position to a regional one. Here, the Geopolitical reasoning, both in Qatar and Turkey, converged at some point. So here the question, why Turkey and the Saudi Arabia are diverting the roads and having tension, since the Saudi geopolitical reasoning and the Turkish geopolitical reasons, reasoning is not converging uh, as much as Turkey and the Qatari converge. 
Here, uh, there has been some test cases uh, to consolidate Turkey-Qatar relations. So, one was Gaza. Uh, when there was, you know, to 2012 and then 2013, uh, the Israeli attacks, Turkey and uh, Qatar played, uh, you know, some important roles to bridge the gap uh, between the Palestinians and also in terms of providing a ceasefire. Uh, and then the other one was Syria. If you look at the Turkish and the Qatari position in Syria, it is to support opposition and uh, provide the transformation. And the third case is the Egypt. You see again, you know, a convergence of Turkish and Qatari position, which very much, you know, uh, wants the societal masses, the Tahrir spirit, to take over the rule in Egypt and have, you know, popularly elected government. Here, the convergence is more or less about the security of transformation in this Arab, in this Arab Spring. So here in the Egypt, the Saudi position is to rely on a military uh, to provide security of transformation. But Turkish Qatar position converts more or less, you know, relying on Egyptian people, you know, having elections free and fair. So if Mursi succeeds, they are going to vote for him, but if he does not, you know, uh, provide uh, some good performance, people are going to replace with another one. So here, there is this visible convergence, emergence of a partnership which may even go to a strategic alliance level. But the problems are not also, uh, not free from some potential problems. So here, what converges Turkey and Qatar is Turkey's, you know, search for elevating itself from a regional power to an international one, and the Qatar from a small one to uh, a regional, you know, uh, player. So uh, there is no challenge to Qatar in terms of, you know, having an Arab Spring within Qatar, but uh, re regional actors uh, put s pressure on Qatar, which is, you know, as much as a challenge like having such a, you know, turmoil at home. If the regional pressure on Qatar increases to the level that Qatar feels, you know, it's going to give up this re regional aspiration and will go back to this, you know, basic instinct of survival, and then this relations is not, you know, going to continue. Uh, so the other is, uh, there is U.S. withdrawal from this geography, and there is real good room to maneuver. Indeed, it's a great chance for the regional actors to build alternatives to, you know, to have United States on board in terms of, you know, achieving some, uh, ful fulfilling something in here in this uh, geography. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, Turkey and Qatar needs to deliver something. So it happened in Gaza, since we know the Secretary of State Kerry, he said, you know, I very much value Turkish and Qatar role. But here, in the following course, Turkey and Qatar needs to deliver something, needs to build, you know, alternatives, the policies, the approaches. Here, Iran is doing pretty well. On the ISIS, they are, you know, offering something. On some other issues, they are offering something. And that's why Iran in these days have uh, United States more on board than the, any other country, or even though it's going behind the scenes, we'll see uh, probably uh, in future. The final word is Turkey's and the Qatari geopolitical reasoning is very much based on, uh, you know, both, you know, leadership, they put forward that they have ethical positions toward the Arab Spring. But here there is a gap between always ethical position and the political uh, positions towards the issues. For example, what to do with ISIL? So what to do with the uh, Egyptian government? So uh, there is a trust that, you know, the, uh, there may be change, but it is still over there. So the, there is this tension between the political necessity and ethical position. Here, uh, the both states need to bridge this gap to make this uh, alliance uh, sustainable. So here, the final word, there is this, you know, uh, emergence of Turkish Qatari uh, partnership, but there is there are still problems to make this a strategic alliance since it is operating in a real unstable and unpredictable geography. Thank you very much.
شكرا دكتور بولند يبدو اننا اختدمنا بداعش ظهر داعش تجمعنا بالصباح It seems that ISL brings us together we have very little time we want to make best use by your questions but please you must be short we cannot have more than two minutes I give the floor to Mr. Dr. Rafa Bajmi I have received uh, Dr. Maryam, thank you very much. There has been, uh, uh, I hope that you give, won't give you more than uh, more the time, uh, and uh, I would have uh, liked uh, to have more uh, talk about Qatar, uh, where we had a lot of use of Twitter. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, as usual, uh, Ahwaz uh, was there, but not the Ahwazis themselves. Uh, don't you think that it's time to see some people from Ahwaz to come uh, in the GCC country meetings, to be as observers at least. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Ismail, Minister of, Minister of, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Ali bin Abdullah, said that the, the uh, unity between the GC countries is the imagination of people, and uh, we have withdrawn from such meetings. Now we are speaking about integration uh, inside the Arab uh, atmosphere. Uh, as you saw it, uh, historically speaking. There's also the issue of the rapprochement between Iran and USA, which, uh, and, and uh, Oman had played a role in this. Uh, the other thing in fact that I did not uh, attend any Gulf uh, meeting for, uh, unless with uh, Omani presence. So what is it? Uh, are you calling for the isolation of Oman from the it's a Gulf environment. Mr. Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Saad. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. We go back to Dr. Muhammad Musfar again, which, who, uh, you know, Iran is made of Arabs, uh, Kurds, Baluch, uh, Persians. So the issue of the front of liberation of Ahwaz from a practical point of view, do you think it's practical to speak of that now, that you call for a liberation front? Because they are part of the components of the Iranian people and the Arabic language by constitution is taught uh, since the primary school. So how realistic is your call now for this? Dr. Ahmed Ismaili, you focus on the issues between Oman and Iran, especially since 2009, and spoke of the, the, the eclectic relationship and the nature of the religious conflict. The relationship to Iran and Oman, there was no religious aspect in it. Uh, and if you notice that since the end of the 18th century, uh, Oman had rented uh, Bandar Abbas, and there were cooperation and coordination regarding Bahrain, and that uh, Sayyid Sultan had married two princesses. Uh, and so uh, and there were special relationships uh, between Oman and Iran by, by the nature of the geographic situation. As for the principle of neutrality, and when you speak about um, the Oman's uh, uh, not into being uh, integrated in the Arab environment. In 1977, when, uh, uh, in 1977, uh, when somebody invaded uh, Basra, your, uh, your sultan sent a fleet to help uh, uh, the people of Sudan. And there was also cooperation between the different sultans uh, who uh, and uh, the Omani, uh, Saeed when Taymour himself uh, visited uh, King Farouk, uh, and when two schools were inaugurated, uh, Saeed Mithir brought teachers from Palestine. So, speaking, uh, as Oman is part of the Arab nation and the GCC network, and uh, it's not isolated. Abdullahi be brief, please. Uh, we cannot hear him. 
Dr. Muhammad Nisfer, you are my friend, but I differ with you. Uh, in, uh, on the maps that you and history spoke of. Nevertheless, if you, if you history, you, you, you talk about just like good history of Palestine, but if it is a call for a Gulf Arab war against Iran, this is a chauvinist appeal, dangerous one, and will go back to what Saddam did, and you know what is up with that. As for uh, Maryam, the Gulf uh, regimes are uh, enemies of uh, Twitter. Uh, that, that's why they has uh, they have now they, they imposed uh, five years imprisonment on those who use uh, Twitter for, against them. And, what about the relationship between the nation, the, the peoples, uh, the nations uh, that link uh, Oman to Iran? Uh, this uh, conflict, in fact, will be only temporary. Dr. Sarhan Atiri. We thank all the speakers, the panelists, for their very good presentations uh, that were very useful. First question to Maryam. She spoke about the role of Twitter, international relations, and uh, relations between peoples. The question is, is there com have you made a sort of comparison between those who have used their real names or uh, false names uh, and how much they are committed to morals and uh, good conduct uh, and political discussions. The other question to Mr. Dr. Ahmed Ismaili. Dr. Ahmed Ismaili uh, is talking about the history of the Emirates, the Abbasis, and uh, said that uh, Oman during these periods uh, was away and uh, through from this, uh, and then said that Oman does not want to integrate it of course, in the Arabic uh, order or the, the GCC. So do you have a political uh, philosophy behind this, not to be integrated, since you have a history of non-integration, and to be integrated even now in the modern time, you should not be integrated with the Arab regimes? Dr. Mahmoud Murad. After the July War 2006, uh, launched by Israel on, Iraq, on Lebanon, Qatar helped uh, with, along with the other uh, GCC countries, Saudi Arabia and Emirates, to compensate. Uh, today I heard a very good opinion by Mr. Mohammed Nusrat when he announced that uh, one should not, uh, uh, not speak about what's happening. Uh, who is the great uh, Satan in Ahwaz's issue? And the second question to Ahmed Smail. You, you call for the neutrality of Oman and you want the other GC to do so. But suppose that somebody comes into the room now and said to us that you must give us a, a, a specific name. Everything has a name, the Arab Gulf has a name, and came someone and said to us, uh, I will not come into your room unless you change word, the word Arab by Persian in the Gulf Persian. Would, so would you accept that? Dr. Mohammed, I thank everybody. I have two remarks. First of all, the map. The geographic space on the map does not present the real borders of Al Muhammad al Akhwaz. Yes, there are Arab presence uh, for long distance. There are so many tribes, especially the whole uh, tribe, that have uh, ruled this region. Uh, and I had spoken one of, one of uh, the members of the Front of Liberation Ahwaz, and he told me that this is an exaggerated map. Uh, even they, they admit that. Uh, second, as Mr. Ahmed Ismaili, Oman, as to say by the original man, during its history, have uh, played a good role in the Emirate Arab eras. And Oman has always played a role in the Arab issues. One of the important components of religious in of Oman that has its effect in Libya and Algeria. Zaid al thank you. We thank all the speakers. Dr. Mariam, you addressed a very important issue, and I was honored to
preside the cultural program on the Book Fair 2014, and we organized a seminar on this issue. Rumehi said if had Hosni Mubarak read this book, he would not have been toppled. I would say had the rulers of the Gulf been reading what's been written in books and on Twitter, they would have benefited a lot. The issue of Ahwaz is, uh, from the political point of view, I agree with Dr. Muqaddam, especially we speak about multiple ethnicities within Iran. Will this apply later in Iraq with respect to the Kurds? Second, what to what degree the sectarian dimension have an impact in the Ahwaz or the Arabistan as Turkey and Qatar, the rapprochement between Qatar, with all respect, it is a GCC member, <coughs> and Turkey under Erdogan with the new mindset of the Ottomans, the only common ground with them is the uh, strategic alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood. In the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I thanked Turkey on the liberal or civilian and also for the new Ottoman ideology that's being marketed and promoted and advocated by Ortega. I have a question to our Turkish friend here. I see three dimensions playing in every relationship or position locally or regionally. We have the ideology, which goes from individual loan, as we see in Oman, an Arab ideology, as we see in those who talk about uh, pan-Arab, and the Islamist, which goes further into the Islamic world. That's one dimension. The other dimension is conservative versus liberal which is an attitude dimension, whether you are talking about the people or the government. And the third dimension is uh, the type of ruling system. Is it centralized or is it democratic? Thank you. Now, when we go to Turkey, and I am a frequent visitor of Istanbul, I like it very much. Uh, I like it too. I see I cannot really put my finger on how it is going, following what Erdogan you know, says today or tomorrow or yesterday. Um, I would like to know whether, you know, by focusing on reading the history and our relationships, rather than focusing on the fluid fluidity, the change that happens and, and affects the attitudes of decisions taken. Shukran, 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 Dr. Antoine. How is the Turkish? Dr. Antoine, Dr. Antoine. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to comment on all the exciting papers. However, I will uh, direct that question to Mr. Aras. It is reported, widely reported in the Arab world, a comment say that Turkey are refraining from playing a rationalizing role in Egypt following the revolution and uh, supporting Morsi regime have exacerbated the situation and caused more deterioration, causing divorce between the political uh, Islamist uh, tide and the liberals in general which we can name as a counter-revolution. Also, the Turkish uh, Saudi rapprochement on Syria was a disaster and catastrophic on the Syrian revolution. How do you comment on this? We'll start by Miriam uh, commenting on Twitter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With Twitter and the paper, I was very systematic and uh, had an approach for all the tweets on the withdrawal of ambassadors, even some comments which are very obscene, where 
reflecting the inferiority of the discourse uh, that has been abbreviated by uh, F word in English, which is an obscene taboo, and the Arab code. As Dr. Daffer mentioned, the Qatari tweets are present analyzing, uh, uh, and they are present in the paper as the paper approached all the tweets, and none was excluded simply for the statistic and breakdown of the information in all the scientific approach used in analysis. The Gulf uh, rulers are enemies to Twitter. As a matter of fact, uh, if we apply what is being said on the freedom of speech, we find that rulers are enemies to any attack or criticism. However, if the tweets are turns into a platform for defamation, libel, and slander, then the government have the right to exercise, have a right to exercise to protect themselves from the legal perspective. And the, as applicable, not only in the Gulf countries, but in the world countries. Analyzing the tweets and uh, Anonymous, uh, we found that some of them were advertised under taswiq or marketing, and the tweet is a prayer. He is promoting one idea, one video, or other tweets. This explains that the anonymous names were also included in the paper. Well, the future will uh, witness more approach more towards Iran. Thank, we thank all those who commented or raised questions. The integration between Oman and the Arab world from the political indications, not the social. Even from the historical perspective, integration between Oman and the Arab world, not only the GCC, Oman throughout history, since the second Hijri century, has been independent from the central Islamic state. Now, Oman is not willing to promote its his history. Oman has never been concerned, historically speaking, with the in-depth Arab causes. It went far east of Africa, overseas, Balochistan, Bandar Abbas. The political indications to the principle of integrity is clear through the diplomatic principles in Oman. The principle of neutrality and non-intervention in other affairs is reinforcing the same independence of the Omani character. With respect to the Dr. Muhammad, I did not claim that the religion was a key factor in, the, uh, in Oman. Oman cannot manipulate religion as a key player. It will have certain implications on the fabric. It will dismember disconnect and divide the fabric uh, which is made up of multiple ethnicities and sects. Well, Qatar, uh, is there a convention in Turkey? Well, there are a couple of questions, but the uh, conversion point, I guess, uh, what is Turkey's role in Egypt? Well, Turkey's stance has been read outside as the pro Mursi kind of understanding prevails, but, but the Turkey's position is more pro-Tahrir, more pro-revolution in Egypt. So here, you know, whoever they choose, Turkey is going to support, but, but they need to choose. They need to give it a chance 
to choose their leaders. So here Turkey is, you know, the Turkish transformation is an interesting transformation, but, but Turkey is more democratic, more, you know, uh, focusing or keeping uh, that, uh, a cultural background. Uh, so here, uh, what Turkey tries to do to, you know, to develop a moderate, you know, Muslim democratic state, which is in peace with its own society, uh, but it, it, it doing it, you know, uh, in a very problematic geography. Also here in in Turkey, Turkey is not a perfect democracy, but it is more democratic in comparison to ten, ten years earlier, previous decade. So the Turkey is facing problems at home in terms of democratization, societal peace, etc. But but Turkey reflects in its foreign policy. So Turkey likes to see in Syria what he tries to do at home. This is the major difference, you know, with the Saudi position and the Iranian position towards those countries. It's very much like Iran likes to see in Syria what they have in Iran. So this is not the Turkish position there is, but there is this di divergence. So Qatar is a GCC member. Uh, we acknowledge it. We like GCC to be very operational, powerful organization. We need a system. We need a concert here. And it is better to do Arab League and the GCC. But here we don't see it. You know, up to one month ago, there were no uh, GCC ambassadors here. So you are going to have a summit, but no ambassadors. And, and the thanks God, there are ambassadors. Here, uh, the Turkish-Saudi relations, the, the Turkish perception is that, you know, Saudi is uh, going alone. And here, there is no chance of, you know, rapprochement between Turkey and the Saudi if Saudi policy continues as, as it is. So uh, Turkey has its own political agency. Uh, and, and then that, you know, based on political agency, Turkey follow its policy towards Arab countries as well as towards the Iran. And, but if there emerges chance of cooperation based on rational calculations, then it will, it will happen. Dr. Mohammed Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I regret to say throughout the conference days, I believe that many of the speakers, uh, as if they are echoing the voice of rulers beyond the walls of this chamber. Second, I had hoped that all the questions raised, I had hoped or had expected from the representative of the Iranian ambassadors. Regretfully and unfortunately, the, the questions were raised by Arab who have a stature in the GCC countries. However, Mr. Akri, you misunderstood. I did not call, please give me, allow me to speak. I did not call for a war against Iran. And I'm not in a position to call for a war in against any country, neighboring country. I'm against wars. All the accusations in the GCC, without exceptions, they have been accusing Iran that it is intervene, intervening in the, the domestic affairs, uh, King of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Yemen, Somalia, Djibouti, even in the Comoros, and no one is speaking of them. Is it out of courtesy towards Iran or to placate Iran? Your rulers are say, your governments are saying that the Iran is intervening. With respect to the Arab star, the map I projected here is not made at home. It is available in the Atlas books. It is available on all the geographical sites. It is not the work of my hand. Why do you object? However, we lack all the Arab maps where Septa Malila and all the other occupied or areas as if the causes of these countries is time barred. It is very significant. The sectarian dimension, it is present in Arabistan. All the Sunni like in Tehran, do not have one single mosque. However, they are objecting uh, uh, for the absence of the Husseini 
in the Arab countries with respect to the silent devils. There are many, chief among them the Arab educated top thinkers and elite, namely in the Gulf countries. With respect to the last question, the GCC, if uh, they believe that Iran is intervening their domestic affairs, they have the mechanisms and, and instruments to shake Iran from within as if uh, exactly as Iran is occupying the Emirati uh, islands and intervening with the Bahraini and Saudi affairs. The last to conclude, it is important out of patriotic national Arabism to maintain and to preserve our entity, to have Arabistan as an observer member of the GCC, like some of the countries. Ahmadinejad himself was invited to the Gulf Council meetings. Those members are required to call a representative of the Arabistan to be an observant member. We thank our speakers, Mariam Al-Khatam, Mohammed al Misfar, Ahmed Smaili, and Poland Chorus. Thank you for attending this session. And we invite you to join us after the recess.